beginning with a variable. Now in processing or even in programming in general, there comes a time where we need to store a piece of information. That's what a variable is. Now as your book references, the author talks about how every time he introduces variables to his class, he tries to come up with a new analogy, a new way to explain the concept. I laughed when I read that paragraph because I've had to do the same thing every time I teach the concept of variables to students. It's trying to explain what is a variable to make it make sense, to come up with some new kind of perfect analogy that makes sense to everybody. But I haven't figured out what that perfect kind of metaphor is, that analogy, that way of explaining it. It's just simply a variable points to something in the computer's memory. If we want the computer to remember something, we need to be able to point to it. That is what a variable does. It allows us to point to that. Now we have different kinds and types of variables that are available to us and every programming language will usually have its own idiosyncratic way of referencing these different kinds or types of memory. The reason that we have to know what kind or type it is is the computer needs to know how much memory does it need to reserve so that it can store that piece of information. Because if I'm going to have a number, it needs to reserve a piece of information differently than if I have a letter, which is different than if I have a word, because each one of these things takes up a different quantity of memory inside the computer. So the computer needs to know well, okay, you want to know and remember this thing. Great, I'll help you, but I need to know how much space do I need to set aside in my memory to keep track of it. That is why we need to store the different kinds and types of variables that we're going to use on the computer. So one of the first types that we will use will be an integer. An in integer is a whole number and it would be a number that is 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 and we can go really 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 big on the computer but the de defining characteristic of an integer is that it is a whole number it does not have a decimal point, it does not have a fractional component or remainder, it's a whole number. That's the key part on an integer. Now, before I go through and define the rest of the variable types, I'm just going to talk a little bit about naming of variables because as I create an example of the different variable types, I want to type it up on the computer and I'll use a variable name. You can name your variables pretty much whatever you want. There aren't a lot of hard and fast restrictions, but there are good practices that you will want to follow. There are conventions that different programmers use. And if you go to 10 companies and talk to their developers and look at their projects and how they've named their variables, you'll see 10 different philosophies or conventions of doing so. Every organization usually adopts or uses a specific style or way of naming their variables. And they do that so that all of the programmers at the company are going to be using the same methods so that they're able to then share code a little bit easier so you don't have to look at their colleagues code and go, okay, now what does this mean and what does this mean? They can look at it and understand quite readily what it means. But there are a few kind of restrictions on it. 
variables are going to be, they must start with a letter. So I must start with a letter. So I can't begin a variable with a number. I have to begin a variable with a letter. I am not allowed to use a space. So I couldn't say my integer like this. That would be an illegal variable name because there is a space. A space is one of the forbidden characters. So I must always begin with a letter. Convention holds that we begin with the lowercase letter. I'm not allowed to use spaces. Now I can use a number in the middle or at the end of a variable name. I just am not allowed to begin with it. So if I can't use spaces but I want to string together multiple words when I'm naming a variable, I would want to use a different strategy. And there are three strategies that are commonly used. So if I'm trying to achieve my integer, I could use my underscore and I actually too I you can't I was thinking I could use a hyphen but um, that was a, a memory lapse into the wrong language and so instead of using the underscore it's common to use instead what is referred to as camel case where I string together multiple words and I build the distinction between the words by using a capital at my second and subsequent words. So I could do my integer rocks. If three words strung together using capital letters on every word except the first one to make them distinct so that I have my capital, my capital. That makes it a little bit easier to read than if I just use all lowercase. So if I use all lowercase, we can see that that becomes visually a little bit harder to read through. So that is perfectly legal. That is legal. And that is legal. So this one is illegal. So we will delete it from our site. I'm going to delete this from our site for now. So all three of these are legal names. They are allowed names. I would encourage you to use the third version. Use camel casing. This is what most programmers have adopted as their convention, as their stylistic way of stringing together multiple words on a variable name so that it makes sense. So I would encourage you to use that. Now, the second and third versions are separate and unique names because of the capitalization. Variable names are case sensitive. So it's really important that you train your fingers to be consistent when you are typing. Now some of you may be lazy typists and you would just do something like my int or something like that. That works, <coughs> but it's not going to be typically as useful. You want your variable names to be long enough that they mean something in your code, but you don't want them to be so long that you're going to start doing a lot of typos. And if you suck as a typist so that you are really bad at typing, you're a hunt and peck with only one finger on one hand 
and you're super slow and you do a lot of errors when you type, you probably want to use names that are as short as possible that still mean something. If you are a very fluent typist, very skilled, then you can use longer names. But base it on your kind of typing ability. Because if you suck at typing and typing is hard for you, you want to keep your names as short as possible because the fewer characters means the fewer opportunities for a typo. So that would just be my recommendation to you. Best practice in industry is to have your names be long enough to make sense. This is why we string together multiple words on a variable name so that it does start to make a little bit more sense. So that when you look at the code, if I look at your code, I don't see some variable and go, I have no idea what that is. When I was newer to programming, I would often just come up with sarcastic and juvenile names for all of my variables because I was lazy and because I thought it was fun. And then I would look at my code later on and have no clue what it meant because none of my names corresponded to what they were referring to. So you really are encouraged to make your names for your variables correspond to what they're referring to. So then if it's referring to text, something about text should probably be in the variable name. If it's referring to an integer, it should be pretty clear based on your code what it's referring to. So is it the position of something? Is it the score of something? Is it some attribute of an object? Is it, you know, what is it should be apparent in your code? The different types of variables and as we name them, the proper sequence will be type of variable, my variable name, and then we have a choice to assign a value to it now or we can assign a value later. But if my integer is 4, then I put the semicolon, it's the end of a line. So I say type of variable, name a variable. I use an equal sign to indicate I am going to now, after that equal sign, assign a value. I'm giving that variable a value. So if I were to comment out these top lines up there, so if I say my integer is 4, And then if I put it print line my in integer, it's going to to the console output. It will now give me that message. And theoretically, if I do that, it should tell me that. So if I run this, we will see down at the very bottom of the screen in my console log, it did print out a 4. Now. When you're working in the with print line, you don't have to just print a variable amount, but I can certainly include other text. So I could put a quotation mark and then say my integer is and then if I put a plus sign here, it will now put this text and follow it with the value of that variable. So when I run this, down at the bottom we will see it says my integer is 4. And it did not put a space between is and that number because I didn't put a space in my text. If I put the space, now run it, you will see my integer is 4. So my integer is just I've told the computer reserve a bit of memory and in that memory it's going to be an integer and I want the value to be 4. Now if I were to violate this and say my integer is equal to 4.3 and run it, it's now going to give me an error message because 4.3 is not an integer. 4.3 is not a whole number. 
It is a floating point number. It's a number with a value of fractional number, a partial number, the point three. So would you put like that on? The second kind of variable type is numbers with a decimal point. Now I'm putting a space between the variable and the equal sign. The spaces are not necessary. You don't need to worry about white space when you're typing the code. I'm doing that for readability purposes. So now if I were to do 5.678, that is now a number with a floating point. So it's no longer a whole number. 5.678 is not a whole number. It is a number with a fractional amount after it. It's between 5 and 6. So that is a float type of variable. It needs a different quantity of memory in the computer, so we have to reference the variable differently. The third type of variable is character. Character is a single letter, per se, but I mean, it is not, what it is not is it is not multiple characters. So a character is any kind of key you press on the keyboard that outputs something, that's a character. That also includes numbers because we can treat a number as a character, but we can also treat a number as a number that we can you know, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So we have numbers as numerical values, but we also have numbers as letters, representations. So anything that you're typing into a word processor, those characters that show up on screen, that's what a character is. But in this case, character refers to a single one because processing has a different memory type for multiple characters. The reason that S is capitalized in string is because it is not a primitive data type, but it's actually referring to the string class. It's based on how the language is put together. So if you jump ahead in your textbook and you read the chapter about objects, then you will learn about classes. Objects are classes where we can now take the functionality of something and give it more than just simply being. Because a number is just simply an integer, a float, they're just numbers. They don't have any other they don't have any other innate properties, methods, characteristics. They can't do anything except be. A character can't do anything except be. But a string is a group of characters. So it's a composite data type because it's now taking this character data type and putting a bunch of those together, stringing them together. And in doing that, the string class also has a few other characteristics or things that it's capable of doing that we will explore in subsequent class periods. But for now, just accept that string gets capitalized, all the others are lowercase and just move on. Just accept that.
Now a Boolean is a special kind of data type. It is something that has one of two possible values, true or false. It's in many ways the most powerful data type on the computer, possibly because it goes to the very essence of how computers are built. Computers are just a series of switches inside that are either on or off that control the flow of the information, the data that's going through them. On or off, yes or no, true or false. It's something that's a binary operation. You either have a true value or a false value. So a Boolean is a data type that allows us to store a true or a false value. And as we work with that, it quickly becomes something that we use extensively. So we can now start to ask the computer questions. Hey, is this true? If so, I want you to do this. But if it's not true, if it's false, do something else. Because ultimately, that's where it really starts to get interesting and fun on the computer is when you have this true false and then we query that. You ask the computer a question and based on that response you do one of two outcomes. And then based on your ability to kind of build complex queries, you can now have multiple parameters that you're looking for, are they true or are they false, and make all kinds of wonderful magical things happen on screen. So these are the core base data types that we are going to be working with. Integer, float, string, and boolean, the most common. It's nice to know that character is there. We can generally avoid it because string is a collection of characters and string has all the functionality that we need for most purposes. So based on what we're going to do throughout the duration of the semester, we probably are not going to need to worry about that one. So we're not going to need character, but we will use int, float, string, and boolean extensively in the coming weeks. So all of these statements right now assign a value to the variable. They're giving it a meaning. So, so 63, now I'm asking, when I put a double equal sign on the computer, that says it's a question. I'm saying, is this equal to the other thing? That's what the double equal sign means. A single equal sign, like we have on our variable assignments up here, is an assignment. So I'm creating an expression. My integer is equal to 4. I am linking those two together when I use one equal sign. When I use two equal signs, I'm asking a question. Are these two things equal to each other? So assignment, comparison. Assignment, question. So we're, one is setting, one is asking. So 63 is that equal to 63? Is this true or false? True or false? Using a computer track, we'll notice that four exclamation point equal is the computer's way of saying not equal. So we're asking is four not equal to 4.0? And as that answer is now true. So exclamation point in the programming world refers to the word not. We will use it quite a bit because it's sometimes faster instead of asking is something, 
we ask, is it not? Is it not true? Is it not equal to a specific value? So we use the not instead of using the is. So we have is, is not. It's a very common technique in virtually all programming languages. The exclamation point refers to the word not. So if you try to read this in plain language, it's not. Might as well complete that as long as it's up. Now one other important thing on variables before we actually start using them is that we need to remember that we have to define a variable before we're allowed to use it. If I attempt to reference a variable but I have not given it a value, then I am going to get an error message because I'm asking the computer to find something that doesn't exist yet. Variables are not going to be in memory until we reference them. Now there are some languages, some programming languages that do what is referred to as hoisting. That if you reference something in your code but it's defined later on, it will have read through all of your code and go, Oh, well, I know you haven't defined it yet, but it's defined 300 lines later, and I know it's down there, so I'm just going to go grab it and pull it up to where I need it to use it now. Which can be okay, but that can cause some problems of how that value needs to be defined depending on the pathway I got to where I was asking for it. I may not have done everything I needed to do first, and it can cause all kinds of weird, unexpected behaviors. So the fact that processing does not hoist values that it does not already know about that occur later in the code and make them accessible to you is a good thing because it makes troubleshooting a little bit easier. And troubleshooting is something that we're all going to spend way too much time trying to figure out where our code is broken and how to fix it. So if I am going to have a rectangle and I'm going to draw it at, say, 50, 50, and it's going to be, I'll just use all kinds of 50s here for now. If I run this, there's my document. It drew a rectangle. So my size set up the size, drew my rectangle, and that's good. But if I want this to move, if I want this to change, if I want to do anything, well, it might be nice then to be able to reference this with a variable. Now, anytime we're putting something in our code and referring to a value, some programmers say every number that gets referred to in your program should be a variable. Other programmers say, well, if you refer to it more than three times, so if you're referring to the same color in three places in your code, perhaps you should set it as a variable, so then if you decide you want to change the color later, you can do so. That's a good practice. It's similar to how if you do web pages with HTML and CSS that you don't add a, kind of a font color to each paragraph, but then you just set up a global paragraph text color and then you just apply it to all paragraphs. Because then if you want to change your paragraph color, you can change it in one place. But if every paragraph on your document with 300 paragraphs had its own color declaration, yet they're all the same, that would be kind of a stupid way to work. It would make much more sense if they're all going to be the same to reference them in one place so you can change it easily. So we will be referencing moving objects on screen momentarily. In doing so, we typically use a speed value. We say, how fast is it moving? 
as our interaction, as our movement becomes more complex, we refer to speed often in more than one place. But if I decide I want it to be faster or slower, I need to then go in and change all those instances of that speed value. But if I just use a variable, it's going to make it much easier. So we will look at that in action momentarily. So right now it drew a rectangle. But this rectangle, it has its x position, it has its y position, it has its width, it has its height. Now, if I were to do something like integer and say x is equal to 50, so if I set my variables now I can draw my same rectangle using x and y. And we could even extend this and reference the width and height. But if I do this and run it, currently I'm not seeing any change. Still drawing it in the same place. Now as your code grows more complex, it sometimes is going to be, oftentimes it's going to be much easier to find and locate values that you want to work with if they're variables that you define at the beginning of your project. If you define the variables inside your function, which now may end up having 50, 100, 2, 3, 4, 500 lines of code, by the time we finish the semester, you're very likely going to be looking at hundreds and hundreds of lines of code in your project, which may seem terrifying right now and make you want to run screaming from the room. That's okay. This end of the semester is many weeks away. But it's not that big a deal because a lot of the code, a lot of the programming you do, it's somewhat repetitive. It ends up being you're repeating it and then the computer is then repeating within those repeats, doing even more of the heavy lifting. So it, it gets, if you want to draw 10 objects on screen, well, you have to tell the computer where are those 10 objects going to be. Well, if every object has an X and a Y, if every object has a width and a height, well, that's 10 times 4. That's 40 lines of code right there for positioning those objects. Then you have the drawing lines to draw those objects. So then that's 50 lines of code to draw... 10 objects on screen. It's not bad. It's just how it is. So when you look at code and start to see, wow, I have all these lines and oh my gosh, I'm all overwhelmed. It's not that bad because a lot of it starts to become a little bit repetitive. Now when we start talking about, hey, what if you put 10,000 objects on screen? And we will be doing examples where we will have thousands of things that you have now created on your sketch. Thousands. But we will come up with ways so then you may only have to do five lines for that thing. But then we tell the computer, hey, draw a thousand of these. And it will. And it will be very fun. When you're putting the variables in, the variables where you put them in your code, you can put the variables where you want them. As long as you don't call upon a variable before you've defined it. So you can put it wherever you want. And that's okay. But, huge but. But if you call in a variable and it hasn't been defined yet, your program will break. Period. And when it breaks, it's dead. It's not like, oh, HTML, CSS work kind of, you know. If you screw up, it mostly works. And half the time, actually, you know, many times you've written code and you are screwed up and you don't even know it. Um, because you can easily make your page and it works just fine. Your HTML, your CSS, all of that works great on a web page. You run it through the validator and you realize your code is actually totally hosed and broken and you had no clue. But it works in most browsers. So you're like, yeah, see, it works great. In processing, it either works or it will be dead. So the convention is define all your variables in one place. That way, you can find them. Because if 
as you get into the multiple hundreds of lines of code, if you have variable declarations occurring in all kinds of different places, you're going to be hard pressed to figure out where they are in your code. And you'll have to use the search function, and it won't. It's just not good. So define them at the beginning. Now, there are going to be some differences that we will look at about why you would do something differently, or if you're making a temporary variable, which we will cover later, but we're not getting into right now. So right now, my object isn't doing a whole lot. It's parked there. But if I were to modify this, and if I were to say x is equal to x plus 1, put a space there so it's consistent. Again, when you put spaces between your operands here, it's not necessary. In my own personal code, when I type it, I don't put any of the spaces in because I'm lazy. But it makes it a little bit more readable sometimes to have those spaces. So now x is equal to x plus 1. So when I run this, it comes up and we'll now see the box is moving. It's moving one pixel at a time. And because I'm not redrawing the background, the pixels that have been changed stay. That's the key thing in processing is pixels will stay at whatever they are until you draw something else over them. So the background is the default gray. The box shows up. And as it moves, it's now drawing over the top of it because it's moving one pixel at a time. And its stroke, the frame around the box, is one pixel in size. It creates that solid black trail. If we were to move two pixels and run it, you will see now we get a line appearing. And it also moved a little bit faster. So you're just saying x is itself one. So this statement is saying x is equal to what x was plus two more. So I'm adding 2 to whatever it is. So it's now increasing the value of x. Now, right now in your book, it uses this methodology of saying variable is equal to variable plus some value. There is, later on in the book, but also in other programming we will also find, you can say, this, which is plus equal. This is the programming shortcut method of saying x is equal to x plus 2. We just say x plus equal 2. So we, by seeing the plus equal sign, this is now setting it up so that we take our value, we add two more to it. These two lines are equivalent statements. You can use whichever one works well for you. The second one is the one that is more commonly used. So I would encourage that syntax for you. Plus equals. But these two lines generate the same result. But if I leave both in my code, how quickly is my box going to move now? Is it going to move two pixels per frame? It'll move four pixels per frame because x gets increased, then x gets increased again. So our box now should be moving pretty fast with a bigger gap between boxes. If I want to get rid of that trail. I can just fill the background with white, gray, black, color, whatever. But I'll just use white, run it, and now we just see the box move. 
All right. So a conditional is just simply we ask, is this true? And if so, do something and if that's not true typically we will say go do something else instead so we want to ask hey has x hit 400 if so let's start going back the other way So I'm going to ask the computer a question. If, and now, what I want to know. If x is greater than, I'm just going to start out with 350. So I'm using as my operator, I'm using the greater than sign. So if x is greater than 350, so has my x gotten bigger than this? Then we put in a curly brace and then on the next line and th this is where we're going to run into a little problem. If x is greater than 350, then we have to figure out how to move it. Well, we were moving based on this number, and we're going to start referring to speed more than one time, or quantity, so we might want to set it up as variable, because when I hit this point, the moment I move back, is that going to be true anymore? Nope. So then I will get caught in this. Oh, I move back. Oh, it, well, now I'm not greater than 350. I move. Oh, now I'm greater. Th and I uh, will get caught in this. So I'll move over and then it'll kind of do this bumping okay. on the edge. Like oh, you want to see that? Fine. So if x has exceeded a certain amount, subtract, otherwise add, so move, 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 and then I'll start going back and forth and create. What is the else? The, like, or else? So we say if our first condition is true, do this first, else when that's not true, do this other thing. Oh, wrong key command here. And now we get the little wiggly, spastic, seizure-inducing box stuck on the edges of screen. And it's trying. It's trying to go. And it's stuck. So you can see it flickering at the edge. So this doesn't quite work. There's a more, in visual programming, there's a common way of dealing with this that we're going to do. Because if we notice, I have to get those the same. I have two numbers that are the same. So I'm referring to, the, in essence, the same number twice in code. But if I decided that I wanted to make my box move faster, put in fives, I had to change something twice. Well, that's now just bad form. Because I had to change the same, what is in essence the same value twice. And we can run it and see it'll move faster now. And now it gets even more spastic at the edge. 
They're like, yeah, it's not working. Okay. So a better technique is to represent that value So I create a variable. My speed, and I set it equal to 2. And now if I change these, now this is going to give me the same result uh, with the 2, the slower spastic, but I can see it works. It's a good practice when you're programming to do a little bit of code, run your program. Do a little bit more, run your program. If you type in a gazillion lines of code without ever hitting run, good luck figuring out where the problem is. Program in pieces. Change one thing, run. Change one more thing, run. Because otherwise, you won't know what you changed that now broke it. So it's really important to do a little bit, run, a little bit, run, a little bit, run, so you can figure out where your problem is. And this is assuming that you will probably run into problems along the way. Most of us will. So the better way to do this is to leave that line out. <clears throat> so we set the speed, but when we hit the wall, and we can even just dispense with the else right now. If if my object hits the end, reverse the speed. So if I try this, you can see it bounces off the wall. And then it just keeps on going. Now, speed is equal to negative speed. So if we want a value to be set equal to a negative version of itself, in essence, what math operation have I performed? What if I added, subtracted, multiplied, or divided by to get that result? How do I get something to become a negative version of itself? What? Multiply by negative one. Yep. Multiply by negative one. So more commonly you will see this written as speed multiplied by negative one. That is what you will see more commonly. You will see that more often than speed is equal to negative speed. So if you go look at resources for doing animation programming, visual programming, game programming, interactive programming, when you want to change directions, speed is multiplied by minus 1. And that gives you the result. So that is the more common nomenclature. So that is what... And we can still prove this works. Bounce it off the wall. Now, if you're enterprising, you will go, wait, wait, wait. It just went off the left margin now. So now I need to figure out how to keep it from going off screen in the other direction. There's a couple of ways that we can do that. I am going to demonstrate the long way first and then show you the better way. So first we will go the long way. So the long way would be to extend this else if x is less than 0, speed
speed times equals minus one, closing curly. So if we look at this, what we will see is in these two instances, we're reversing the speed, but we're doing the exact same thing. Anytime you repeat the same code, that should tell you in your programming that there's probably a better way to do it. Because one of the beauties of programming is figuring out how to reuse or to simplify. So I say, if I get too far to the right, change my direction. And if I get too far to the left, change it again. Because if I take a negative number, times it by a negative number, I get a positive number. So if my speed is minus two times it by minus one, that gives me a speed of two. So this will create now a bouncing object. And I'm going to make it go faster by increasing my speed, because I can. One of the mantras that I will encourage you to have when you're coding is, if you can, do. There's no reason not to. So now I have this bouncing back and forth. They're recording again. So the double pipe, which is the key right below the delete key on the keyboard, double pipe, is or. That's how we write the word or when we're doing programming. Some programming languages actually use the words and and or. Most programming languages will use the double ampersand. Or I mean, not double ampersand, the double pipe for or, and we'll use a double ampersand to represent and. So if we want to know if something and something else, then we'll do that. And we'll look at that in a little bit. So right now, this is how I say or, using the double pipe. So if this is true, or if this is true, execute that line of code. As I said, this is the shorthand way. It's a little bit cleaner. So if one or the other is true. Now, sometimes you will want to have this make be a little bit easier to read. So you may use additional parentheses. So you will take each item around that is um, on each side of the pipe and put parentheses around it to make it a little bit easier to read. Uh, some people even go in very complex examples. Some people might even go so far as breaking things onto separate lines. So there, you can put extra line returns to help make your code more readable. That is OK. So I have seen it where people, because if your conditional statement is a really long thing, and we'll get to some much longer examples very shortly, you might need to do it that way. So if the first expression is true, or if the second expression is true, change my speed. So if I run, back, forth, back, forth. So now that allows us to query for that, that. But what we're doing, though, is we're only checking our x parameter. And there will be times where perhaps the question of, well, what if it's going diagonally and it's hitting any of the four walls and doing, if we need to check top and bottom, we need to put that in as well. But top and bottom are really related to our y value. So currently I have a speed, but I'm really referring to moving it on the x axis. So it's really a speed for my x, not a speed for my y. So we can have a separate y value that we use. <coughs> so
so I can make a speed y. Some of you will go, well, then we should change speed to speed x, which would be a good plan. I may do that a little bit later, but I'm going to leave it for the time being. But I have speed y, set that equal to 5. Now if I take y and set that equal to my speed y, at the moment I should see it go through and behave similarly to what we saw before with the diagonal oh bounce. But if you are watching very carefully, if you watch very carefully, you'll notice it hits the wall and then it reverses, but the y is still dropping. So I have my x boundary checking going on, but I'm probably going to need to do a very similar operation for my y boundary checking. So if y is greater than, well now it's 350 as well because I changed the size of my document, or if y is less than 0, speed y times equal minus 1. So this will now allow it to start hitting all of my edges and if I start it out, well, change so I don't, let's make it so it's no longer square, this will allow it to not move at a 45. So now we can see I have an object ping-ponging around on the screen. So I changed the size of my document to make it asymmetrical because my x and y speeds were the same. When I had a square document, it was starting in the corner, it was going to be stuck permanently in that diagonal stretch. But now I can create something that animates quite handily. Object. Animating my second object means I need a second set of parameters here. So I'm going to have this my x, c, y, c, because I'm going to do a circle. Speed x, c, speed y, c. I will start drawing it at a different point so it's not in the same place. So then it will be bouncing in its own convoluted, messed up manner. So this would be a good instance to demonstrate a good practice of property of putting in a comment properties of box. Then I will go down and properties of circle. So I have those. All right. So now I'm going to put things in that I know and I don't remember what I call them. XC. And we'll make my circle. So now that draws an ellipse, I can run this. Oh. An unexpected token. So this is move circle based on speed. This one is no longer two pixels, but based on speed and speed y. And this is based on speed xc and speed yc. So at this point I just need my conditionals to do my checking and it can be this would be a good instance of copy paste. My caution when doing copy paste on code is it's really easy to screw up while well, you do it because you 
don't change everything, and then you get unexpected behaviors. So I think I changed all the necessary parameters. So now at this point, if I run it, we will see that they're now working on moving independently. Every object, ooh. Okay, oh, the placement, because the circle is drawn from the center, the rectangle drew from the corner, so I need to change my numbers appropriately. So we know that that three seventy five. This would be minus twenty five. Minus twenty five. Not two fifty eight. Minus twenty five, and then two seventy five. Let's see if my circle now goes. Now the circle. Whoa. Oh, oh, go the other way. Yeah, not minus 25. It's not minus. My bad. There. Now my circle and my box are behaving. They're moving and animating independently of each other. And to make it more dramatic, it would make sense to have them at different speeds so that they don't necessarily move in... Uh, So now we're behaving a little bit differently. So we can see a little bit more individual behavior going on with those objects. So to use my color variables in my project, I have, I define it as color, and I say my variable name, and then I reference what value I'm assigning to it. And I say color, and then I put these three values in. Fill box color fill circle color specify the color draw the object specify the next color draw the next object run it they're now separate colors Again, this goes back to if you use a variable, it makes it much easier because all the things you would want to change are contained up at the top of your document. So when you want to go change size, change speed, change color, it's all right there at the top and you just change it there. You don't have to hunt through and go find on line 128, oh, that's where that color is. That's the one I need to change. It's much easier to define as much as you can with the variable because then you can find things. It's so much better. So your homework is to go completely psycho using variables. Well, you might go completely psycho doing your programming anyway, but I want you to use variables for everything that you can, everything that makes sense to do so. And then make your thing animate. So if your thing was super complex, Simplify. If your thing was too simple, complexify. No. I really shouldn't make up bad words, but add to it. Make it better. That's what I need to see. Good luck.